Welcome everybody to our fourth session of the day. We are here with Kate King, and she's going to be explaining to us and going through with us understanding anxiety and learning. So Kate provides support for ed and advice for parents, tutors, students, and schools. So with over 20 years of experience as a specialist teacher and Sunco, Kate's theoretical framework underpins her practical experience. She has a postgraduate diploma in dyslexia and DCD ADHD, combined with training across many other things that impact on learning. This enables her to make links and see past labels. Recognizing and respecting neurological differences as human variation, Kate advocates an approach that is centered on the needs of the individual. She breaks down labels, providing practical recommendations and strategies that enable effective support and intervention at home and in the classroom. Recommendations do not just focus on the current challenges, but build towards the next stage of education journey. Kate's bespoke empathetic approach facilitates communication between all involved, enabling parents, students, and teachers to feel empowered. So without further ado, Kate, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's really lovely to be here today. Um, I'm, gonna I'm about to share a screen with you, and um, when the as I go through the presentation, please don't hesitate to just unmute and dive in with a question because, you know, rather than hold it and forget it, um, then just do do just that. Um, if I, something I'm going to be dealing with, I'll say that. If not, we'll just do a little of a divert. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end for some, for some questions if you've got them um, there and any discussions around what I'm going to cover. Obviously, I haven't got so long that I can cover everything to do with anxiety and learning, but hopefully um, I'll give you a bit of um, a bit of an insight and, and my view. Um, so here we go. So can you all see that? Okay. So this is who I am. Uh, my business is uh, Skylark Specialist Education Consulting. And as um, Sarah Lynn very kindly said, I'm a special educator um, with over 20 years experience of all the different things that impact on learning. So is it stress or is it anxiety? Where, where does one stop and the other one start? So we've got causes of stress which is basically whenever we feel that we haven't got the resources to cope with the situation. It doesn't matter what that situation is. It could be life, it could be relationships, it could be work deadlines, it could be exams, it could be learning. It doesn't really matter what it is. And if we look at anxiety, we've got four different kinds of response to anxiety, to stress. We've got behavioral responses. We've got our physiological, so insomnia, appetite increased, reduced, whichever. Um, we've got physical pain. Mommy, I've got tummy ache, I don't want to go to school. We've got cognitive. So that's a, our inability to work out what the hell is going on. Um, and then we've got our emotional response to stress, which is our fear, depression, and this is where anxiety comes in. So this is sort of technicality of the difference between anxiety and stress, which I thought was worth covering. But you know, a certain amount of stress is actually good for us. A certain amount of anxiety is good for us. Um, but, but anxiety is the emo emotional response to stress. So here we've got a curve that, that was established many years ago um, Sorry, by. Question. Yeah. Um, so you know when people say they're feeling stressed, they probably mm -hmm. mean they're actually feeling anxious because stress is the trigger. And actually, all the other feelings are our are, are response to stress. So, in many right, ways, yes. better language when people use the word stressed is a helpful thing as well, trying to get that language going. Yeah. Yes, I think it's, it's, I don't, to me, I don't think it really matters too much. I think, I think that when we, when we think about when children are suffering from anxiety, we actually need to, to go, okay, well, this is an emotional response to stuff that is outside their control. Yeah. Thank you. Or, or we, we don't have the resources. We don't yeah. have the resources to cope with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very so much. Here, it's okay. Um, so it can be helpful because, you know, can sort of drive us up. It can wind us up. It can fire us up. 
Um, and we, you know, cognitively know through um, through MRI scanning that our brain function can increase with mild stress. You know, we can nothing like a deadline to concentrate the mind, as I'm sure we all know. Um, but we get to this optimum arousal, and then if we have too much, it affects our it, it affects our performance because too much stress can be a difficulty. And it's the, the point, it's that tipping point, that point of, we go past the peak of the curve and it starts to impair our cognitive functioning, our brain functioning. So what's going on in the brain? Well, we basically got three bits to our brain. We've got our reptilian brain, which is the bit that keeps us alive. It's our primeval, um, you know, am I gonna fight that saber tooth tiger or am I gonna run away from it? I'm certainly not gonna mate with it. And then we've got our limbic system, which is the next level. Um, so this is our emotions and it controls our emotional brain. And it also obviously controls our interaction with others. Now our limbic system also controls our senses. So it's our limbic system that will, that will be involved when we smell that wonderful smell I go, oh, that's just delicious. I absolutely love whatever it is. Or, oh, I can't stand that smell. It's completely beyond our thinking. We don't need to think. It's just happening automatically. But um, because it's part of our emotions and our empathy, um, we need it. It's, it's a very important pathway into our higher order functioning brain, our human brain, our neocortex, right, which is our logical abstract thinking brain. So prefrontal cortex, neocortex, the two terms are interchangeable. I tend to use prefrontal cortex. Um, but we need, this is our air traffic control centre. And this is the bit that we need to engage to be able to decide what we're going to do, make those decisions. There is a dynamic relationship between cognition and emotion on a neural level. It's constantly firing between each other. Our ability to, to think logically is affected by our emotions. We all know that as adults. The time in adolescence is where we've got a massive development of the brain in between the, the prefrontal cortex. Um, lots and lots of neurons are being, are being developed, new neurons are being, new pathways are being built. So it's a time of huge growth. But the problem is stress and anxiety, stress or anxiety, whichever, both increase the stress hormones. So there's an increase in adrenaline and cortisol, which can enhance performance and memory up to a point. But too much of it, and it triggers our amygdala, which is down in our reptilian complex. It's part of our fight, flight, or freeze. And that's the bit of our brain that is triggered by things that we perceive to be a threat. Now, the problem is that it's a bit like, you know, if you walk across a field, you often see a path that the sheep have trodden. It's not the footpath. It's just the path the sheep have trodden. And if our brain constantly goes to our, uh, triggers our amygdala, it can happen too quickly, too easily. And this is often what, well, it is what happens when you've got children who've got adverse early childhood experiences um, because it's just their default. Their default is that. And this is often what's happening with children who've got pathological demand avoidance. Because when our amygdala is triggered, we get a disconnection from our cortex, from our thinking brain. We just basically go offline. So that child who's having a meltdown, there's absolutely no point in talking to them about why you're having a meltdown until they've stopped having a meltdown and literally the prefrontal cortex has reconnected. So we have this cycle, okay? Think, we think there's something wrong. We lack the resources to cope. We feel anxious. Then we experience the symptoms of anxiety. And it's this loop. So it's about breaking this loop, which is what today is about. Um, so I, one of the things that underpins my practice is this iceberg, okay? It's very simple. The behavior that we observe is based on a feeling that's rooted in a need. On a very simple level, I'm grumpy, I'm feeling hungry, I need food. And it's a very simple formula to think about when we've got a child and what behavior are we seeing? What's that child feeling? What do they need? So let's unpick this. First of all, so let's look at the symptoms of anxiety. So what we're going to observe. 
to what might we see? We need to be detectives. We need to put these jig this jigsaw together. Well, we might see issues with sleep, appetite. Now, it might not be reduced. It might be cravings for food, comfort eating. What are they avoiding? We all avoid the things we find difficult, whether that's writing or writing a list or cleaning the floors or doing the ironing, whatever it might be, we avoid it. There might be physical symptoms, butterflies, tummy ache, but concentration is poor. We might see challenging behaviours. There might be repetitive behaviours or compulsions, it's a bit of OCD coming in. Or we might have anger, anger meltdowns, that's very common with children. Or we might have regressive behaviour, things like bedwetting. So the feeling, let's have a look a little bit deeper into the feeling of anxiety. So the impact of anxiety, there's basically uh, this lovely A to F, um, which is what's the effect? So emotionally and physically, what do they feel in their body? So this is about us working out what's needed. What are their actions? What are they doing? What's going on through their mind? Are they more dependent on others or adults? I can't do this, I need help. Putting their hand up all the time, constantly seeking reassurance. You know they can do it. You know that they can do it because you taught it to them last week or yesterday. But actually they're asking for that reassurance. Can you show me again? So that's showing you that there is some anxiety. Maybe they've not forgotten. Maybe they just need that reassurance. Is, there, is the impact of the anxiety causing excesses or extremes in relation to the situation? So it could be completely over the top reaction to what's going on. Is it affecting their functioning on a daily basis? So does it, does it mean that they're finding it really difficult to be organized or anything else that's affecting their daily life? So how's it affecting things? So this is quite a useful way of looking at what is the impact of anxiety. So we've seen some we've seen some stuff going on. Yeah. This is how it's impacting. So if there's something wrong, they lack the resources to cope with what's going on. That's the thing that is triggering these feelings of anxiety. This is where we look for their needs. So there's loads and loads of research that tells us that anxiety impacts the functioning of working memory. So working memory is what we can hold in our head and manipulate at the same time. So think, go, if you think back to days before Google and, um, and sat nav, we might stop the car, go into a shop. How do I get to whatever it is? Our short-term memory, we hold the information we're given, we walk back to the car, we get in the car, we start to drive. That's our working memory because we're using it at the same time as we're doing something else. So for a child, if you've got a difficulty with working memory, we will, it's one of the key markers of dyslexia. So we will see things like, um, maybe they're reading. So they're reading the sentence, they come to a word, they have to stop and decode the word, the first part of the sentence is gone. They can't hold it. But they carry on reading after they've decode that, decoded that word or you've given them that word. We get to the end of the sentence. They start the next sentence. Is it going to make sense? Of course it's not. And if it doesn't make sense, are we going to want to read? We're going to put a lot of effort into it. So similarly, we might see this in, this is one of the reasons why we get anxiety in maths is the weakness in working memory. Now we know um, that the verbal working memory is impacted far more than the visual working memory by um, anxiety. So if we're hearing something, we're far, it's gonna be, if, and we're feeling anxious, it's gonna be harder for us to process it than it is if we're seeing something. Now, I don't know why that is, but there's lots of research to support it. But actually, on a logical basis, if I think about it from a personal point of view, if somebody's, if I'm feeling anxious or I've got things going on in my head and somebody says something to me and I'm not really concentrating, sorry, can you say that again? I didn't quite get that. 
So we might need it repeating. So this is the child who's asking for reassurance. Can you say that again? Can you explain it again? Now, there's, um, there's something called auditory processing disorder, which is often misunderstood um, and undiagnosed as well. And it could be that it's just actually we need to rephrase it, or it could be working memory. And then we have processing. So we know that anxiety reduces our ability to process things. We know that as adults, just on our lives, the way we live. We know that when we're feeling anxious, we just, this is where the overwhelm comes, the overload comes, okay? Because of the reduced access to the prefrontal cortex. Now, this could be that we've got too much visual information to process. Or it could be that we've got too much auditory information to process, or that the language being used for the auditory information isn't familiar. So here we here this is one of the reasons why it's really important to pre-teach um, language when it comes to uh, things like scientific subjects. So because if we know what those words mean before we dive into the subject, then it's going to be far easier for us to access the subject. Whereas if you've got the teacher and they're spouting off about something and they use words that we really don't understand, we're going to feel anxious. Yeah, we're going to feel unsettled. And if we're feeling anxious, our mind's going to get distracted. We can't process the rest of it. We're going to lose the plot. We've, we've had a bit of a dial out. And the next thing we know, we dial back in. And actually, we, we haven't got a clue what they're talking about. So our anxiety levels go through the roof. And we fire up the amygdala and the whole thing goes pear-shaped. So it's really important to reduce um, re reduce the amount, if you've got somebody who's anxious, to reduce the amount of processing that's need. You use a lot of scaffolding. So you use lots of visual because we know that the visual information is easier and kinder on the working memory. You've got more capacity for that when we're anxious. And we're doing a multi-sensory approach. And the other thing that we need to consider is the impact of sensory needs or sensory situations. So sensory sensitivities can trigger anxiety. Um, I'm going to talk more about this in, in a little while, but basically, if we've, got, if we've got a label that's itchy, we're distracted, aren't we? So that's a sensory need. Yeah? If I'm hungry, that's a sensory need. Um, if I'm in an environment that is too bright or too dim or too noisy or eerily quiet, I'm, or I'm sitting on a chair that is incredibly uncomfortable, I'm going to have, I'm going to be triggering my amygdala. I'm going to feel anxious. I'm not feeling settled. I'm feeling distracted. Now, we often get children who present with symptoms of ADHD. Um, and ADHD is a symptomatic diagnosis. And it's always important to look at why are we seeing the behavior we're seeing? Is that child behaving like that? As in can't sit still or can't concentrate because there is a sensory need that isn't being met. So it's always worth digging a bit deeper on the sensory side of things. So let's look at working memory. So as I said, it's the ability to hold, temporarily hold information in our heads in order to use it to complete a task. So if somebody's got a difficulty with their working memory, what are we going to see? Holding information is going to be hard. Holding instructions while thinking creatively. So this is typical of the child is you give them the brief about what you want them to write about, and then they start this creative process. But what you wanted them to write about, which was very clearly conveyed, it's gone. They can't hold it in their working memory. Trouble following directions. They become lost with multi-step tasks. They tend to interrupt and call out because they fear of forgetting what they want to say. It's impossible for them to take notes while they're listening. Um, so things are incomplete. They didn't write down their homework properly um, because actually the teacher was saying something else at the same time. And they forget things, um, whether, assign whether it's assignments or materials, when things are due, they don't hand work in. So how can we help them? Well, reduce the load. If we don't have to hold in our working memory, 
How are we going to reduce that load? Externalize it. Teach strategies. So using visual and verbal and also using mental hooks. What can I hang that on? What can I use as a, as a tag to remember it? Use technology. So using iPads taking, to take photos of screens, or phones to take photos of screens, really helpful. Color and stick to a system. But the system, the, cut, the use of color, it shouldn't be something that is imposed by us as adults. It should be something that's chosen by the child. Um, there was a child I worked with years ago. I mean, it's, it, you know, we learn all the time from the kids we work with, don't we? And, and he was always in trouble for forgetting his history book. And one day I said, you know, Oscar, why, what's the problem with history? Your history teacher is being driven to distraction. You know, and we're wanting to do some work. And you never have your history book when we want to do stuff. And he said, well, the problem is it's green. I said, what do you mean it's green? And, you know, schools have different coloured exercise books for different subjects. He said, to me, history's orange. So if I've got a history, I pick up my orange book and it's my maths book. So when I get to history, I don't have my history book because it's green. And it was just like a real eye opener. You know, he taught me so much. So actually now it's always a case of what colours work for you? You know, we might think of, of pink for girls and blue for boys but do you know that isn't always the case so always ask the children when you're using colors checklists 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 and again checklists need to be useful you know putting feed the world on a checklist isn't going to work is it because it's too big it's about making a checklist that is useful so putting down tiny little things because smart targets we want to feel that we're achieving we're not going to use a checklist unless it's helpful, unless we're feeling it's, 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 um, it's working for us. So all of this is about externalising, externalising what we're holding in here. Because once we've got it out of here, it's not buzzing around, okay? We know where to find it. And cognitive load. Cognitive load is really, really important. We have to reduce the cognitive load. So if you think about this guy, he's walking up this hill, it's a steep path, you've got a heavy rucksack. If the path was smoother and the rucksack was lighter, his journey would be a lot easier. So if I give you this string of letters and I ask you to take a minute and see if you can recall them without writing them down, I don't know about you, but I would certainly struggle with that. But if we break it down into chunks, how much easier is it? So chunking is really, really important, bite-sized pieces. This is the externalizing side of things. Okay. So to going on to processing in a bit more depth, okay? So it's the ability to perform an automatic cognitive task quickly, okay? But if we've got a problem with processing, whether it's visual or auditory, Information is going to get lost going in, goes in effectively, and it takes time to retrieve. Now, we've all worked with bright kids, really bright kids, really bright kids. They'll take the information in and they'll put it in the right bit of their filing cabinet. And then when you want them to find it, they know exactly which bit of the filing cabinet to go to. The children that many of us work with, it goes in, but when we want to retrieve it, um, it's in here somewhere. Um, where is it? We didn't file it properly. So we can help them by helping them file it properly. Okay? And remember, it can be visual or auditory. So we see that they often don't follow instructions or they ask for the repetition of instructions. And sometimes it's that rephrasing that is what they need. They can seem away with the phones. And they're not away with the families. They are just processing what you said. They might not put their hand up and they struggle to answer things in a coherent way because they're still having to process what they're trying to, if you put them on the spot, they may stumble over their words because they're trying to process what they're wanting to say, put it in the right order in order to be able to say it. Inaccuracies when copying, so don't copy. They can't keep up, they're slow, which is why they often need extra help, and they tend to be disorganized. 
and they're not motivated because it's all really, really hard work. So we give up easily. So with the um, this, this, this difficulty with processing, we will also often see the child who downloads at bedtime. So you've, the child's come out of school, you've said, how was your day? Oh, it was brilliant, I had a really good time, I played with Santa, da, 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 da. And then at bedtime, it all pulls out. The offload, the tears, the anxiety comes out. And often that is because it has taken them that downtime to reconnect their prefrontal cortex, to process what's gone on in the day, for it to be able to come out. So how do we help? Well, don't copy, no point copying. Teach highlighting and key points with summarizing in the margin. There's a lovely um, resource called um, Bullet Point Academy. Um, and one of the things he teaches is doing a summary in the, in the um, in the margin and then you've got your dump you've got your download then you can write from there it's really really useful um, use visual materials remember that it's easier for us to to process if we've got visual as well as verbal so mind maps graphic organizers whatever works for the child um, making links to previous learning so that it's relatable basic metacognition using memory strategies that may be um, you know, five fingers, it could be a mnemonic, it could be um, telling that story, recounting that story, going around a room, all of those study skills techniques that we're familiar with. Teaching heading, subheading, structure, graphic organisers is really, really important because, ah, yes, that's the way, this is one of those questions where I follow this formula. Now, whether that's for writing or whether it's for maths, doesn't matter having a formula to follow a model to follow is hugely important. And if we keep doing that, so with maths, if we've got children who are struggling with particular things, giving them worked examples or helping them build their own worked examples is far more effective than us giving them one, obviously. And if they've got that and they keep doing it, it becomes embedded, it goes into their long-term memory. So they can use that as a crutch when they need it. It's really important to, to teach them how to summarize and how to use summaries as well. And filing, getting it in the right bit of the filing cabinet. That is so important. So I talked earlier about sensory, sensory side of things. Um, this is a, a, for a pyramid from the occupational therapy um, site where they talk. Yes, Erin. Sorry, I was just wondering how we teach filing. How we teach filing? Well, we need to explicitly teach filing. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know about you, but I've worked with a lot of children where we say, right, your, your handwriting's rubbish. We don't say that, obviously. But, you know, handwriting's tricky. Um, it's taking a lot of effort. We need you typing. So we're going to get you typing. And they're proficient at typing and all the rest of it. But they can't find the document, right? So they need help filing the documents. So we need to explicitly teach them. But it's about problem solving, so collaborative problem solving approach. Going okay, so we're going to be, we're going to have to teach you how to do this. So what's going to work for you? How does your brain work? What associations can you make? So it's going back to that color thing again. Um, so where are you going to put it? And when it comes to electronic filing, I think it's a bit like physical filing. It's always good to have a dump basket. Mm. Things I need to file later. Because actually, do you know what? I've done the work. I've just had enough. I'm, I'm, I'm completely spent. We'll put it in there and then we'll sort it out when you're fresh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I was more like, I guess, curious about the, the mental filing. So if I know that I need to know something because we've just talked about it and you talked about filing it in my brain so I can then retrieve it later, for students who might not have that self-awareness or might feel put on the spot and then not have the words to then communicate what's going on in their brain and what might work for them, I'm wondering if if there's a process of explicitly being able to teach them that. So um, the only thing we can do is teach them to, we can link it to something they already know. Okay. Yeah. 
So it's about having a mental hook to hang it on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And 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 doing that. What have I learned? What what was helpful? Was was what I did helpful? If it was great. If it wasn't, well, okay. Let's not do that again. Let's think of something else. So that just review process. So here we have the 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 sensory system at the bottom. Now there's our five senses that we know. Um, but we've also got vestibular, which is balance, and proprioception, which is where our body is in space. Now, these are at the bottom of the pyramid, and at the top of the pyramid is academic learning. And that's the simple reason that anything that's going on with our senses is going to be affecting our ability to concentrate. So we've got um, the, the, the paying attention, but, you know, paying attention is the attention center functions are quite high up. OK, um, we need to be aware of our body. We need to be able to plan. Um, and if there's something going wrong or, or not being able to be processed properly within our sensory system, that's like having a brick missing in the wall or a wobbly brick. And, and that's going to have an impact on our higher order functioning. So I think this is a really important thing to remember when we're seeing the behavior why is that child wiggling what's going on why are they losing concentration is there something that in the sense going on sensorily that we need to change that takes us into autism now many of the children who require additional help or can't access school um, are suffering from anxiety and one of the reasons they're suffering from anxiety is too much is going on. They can't cope. And sometimes these are children who are maybe waiting to be to, on the autism diagnosis pathway, or it's a spectrum. They've got a bit of it. Now, it's not of a level that warrants diagnosis, but it's something we need to be aware of. So we often see difficulties with sensory needs when it comes to children with autism, individuals with autism. They don't like crowded places. They don't like busy, noisy places. It's just too much. You know, think of Chris Packer. You know, he likes to be out in nature. He doesn't like to be in crowded places. Okay. Um, they like to feel in control. So it's about an anticipated event. Okay. So it could be they've got a difficulty with noise and smell and the sensory. And they know that going into the dining room is just, ah. So before they even go into the dining room, they're on high alert. So they can't concentrate in that lesson or they can't process stuff in that lesson. Um, you know, this, it, it can happen for all sorts of reasons. You know, there's, um, I remember teaching a child, he was, he was an absolute nightmare in maths on a Wednesday. Because on a Wednesday, he'd have a football match or a rugby match in the afternoon, and he would be changed at break, at break time. So he was in his kit. Well, he was in his kit, and his brain was anticipating the match. He couldn't think about maths. Couldn't possibly concentrate. On the other days, when he wasn't wearing a sports kit, he was on fire. So it's it's really important to look to try and you know join the dots, make those jigsaw pieces fit together. And performance, so performance anxiety is a huge problem for many autistic individuals. They can't get it wrong. They don't want to get it wrong. It, and you know, their, their personal expectation can, is often way, way, way higher and often unreasonable in comparison to the expectations of the teacher or of you as a tutor or the parent. Or they feel out of control because, you know, one of the things that, that somebody who's on the autistic spectrum, um, it's one of the traits is the need for order. Yeah. And if things are out of order, if things are out of control, then they're going to feel anxious, aren't they? So how can we help them in particular? Well, obviously, being aware of the things that are going to trigger their anxiety, that's really important. But then... Autism is a difficulty with communication. So we can't communicate what we haven't got the language for. 
So we need to give them the language of feelings and emotions. Now we can do a lot of that by modeling, by talking about how we're feeling. We can, uh, there's, there's a phenomenal amount of resources available um, for helping for very young children um, and teenagers um, to understand the language of emotions. You've got emotion wheels um, that, that are easily downloadable from um, the internet, and you can talk about the language, you can have words on the fridge, you can um, watch television programs without the sound on and talk about the emotions that you're seeing. So it's about reading social situations. Um, but if they haven't got the language, they can't label it. So often it's about having a, maybe a personal thermometer and talking about, well, where are we on our thermometer? Where, is our, where are our emotions on the thermometer? And again, you know, what's the color at the top that's the explosion? Um, maybe for such are they see it as a volcano. So once we've got the language, then we need to be able to communicate it. Now, if we're feeling all fizzed up, all anxious, our prefrontal cortex isn't going to be connected. So we can't order our words to be able to communicate, even if we've got the language. So we need to calm down. So for example, I mean, at, um, somebody was talking to me about their son who um, was autistic. And, you know, they would say to him, you know, just calm down. And he didn't know what calm meant. So it's the two-way communication. So you can see how communication and language are very much together in this. And it's about giving them permission. It's permission to have their needs recognized, permission to communicate what it is they need. And then giving them a toolkit of how they can cope. So that toolkit could be all sorts of things. It could be something that is stimulating in a sensory way that they need. So it could be bouncing on the trampoline. It could be something soft and snuggly. It could be a tight hug. It could be leave me alone. It could be all sorts of different things um, that the child needs or the individual needs to help them reconnect their prefrontal cortex. We know that anxiety is very prevalent where we've got a diagnosed learning difficulty. Now, if we think about a diagnosed learning difficulty, you have to reach the diagnostic criteria to be able to get the label. Yeah? If you haven't got the, the box ticking criteria, you don't get the label. And this is this, the statistics behind this, um, this slide are actually relating to diagnosable anxiety disorder. So that's where the anxiety isn't just impacting on life. It's impacting on life in such a significant way that a psychiatrist has diagnosed anxiety disorder. So one in two people who've got a combination of ADHD and DCD or dyspraxia. Now, 50% of people who've got dyspraxia have got ADHD, 50%. 50% of people with ADHD have got dyspraxia. But we often, we only get one of those labels because we've got a label now and that's okay. But when we've got autism, we often have DCD. There's often a difficulty with motor function in some way. Um, and there's often you can have a sensory based motor function difficulty. Yes, Sarahlyn. Just for everyone's benefit, can we also have a clarification on what DCD is? Sorry, DCD is dyspraxia. So it's what we call dyspraxia um, in this country. Everybody else in the world calls it developmental coordination disorder, DCD. Right? Um, uh, because it is a disorder with motor function that affects activities of daily living. And technically, dyspraxia is difficulty with motor planning. But in this country, we use dyspraxia um, rather than DCD. So you may see Americans or Canadians or Australians referring to DCD rather than dyspraxia. But they're, they're interchangeable as far as we're concerned. Thank you. Um, so four in five people who've got the com combination of ASD and DCD have got an anxiety disorder. 
And then one in two people who've got the combination of dyslexia and dyscalculia have got a difficulty with anxiety. Well, that's hardly surprising, is it? You know, you think about how much of the school day is spent with literacy and maths, and you can't do either of them. That's going to make you feel anxious for the rest of the week. So how do we deal with, with anxiety? How do we help these children? Well, emotional freedom tapping um, is, is really helpful because that's something they can do underneath the desk, out of the way, nobody knows. We know that reflexology can be really helpful as well. Um, there's a woman down in Bristol who's done some research as a reflexologist, um, has a child who's autistic, and has done a lot of um, research on the use of reflexology in reconnecting the, um, the, the brain, reducing those anxiety symptoms. Resilience coaching. Uh, there are a number of experts that I know of, and I'm sure you know of many too, who specialise in coaching children to, to build their resilience. Can't do it yet. Um, mindfulness, meditation, yoga. Yeah. Now there's some recent research um, that Tony Atwood was talking about last year that um, has been going on in India to that that backs up the importance of yoga and meditation in helping children with autism to be able to function. And just it's just huge. It makes a massive difference. And I, I'm a big fan of essential oils as well because they work on our limbic system. Um, doTERRA use different blends that, uh, that you can buy as rollers. And it's the sort of thing that, you know, a child can have on a piece of cartridge paper in a little box, take it out and sniff it. They can have a roller, they can use it at break times, times of anxiety. I even know somebody who uses them for teaching um, because our limbic system, as I said at the beginning, is, is bypassed. Um, it's our thinking brain doesn't need to access it. Uh, and she, she used to use orange oil for, um, for teaching history. And um, so when the child was learning history, there was orange oil around. And then if they were in exam, they would use the orange oil and it would just help them access what they'd remember. How does it work? I'd love to know, but all I know is it does. So when we come back to the, yes, Jade. So you're on mute. Thank you. Thanks. What is the emotional freedom uh, free um, tapping? Is that just literally just tapping under the desk? Uh, no, um, it's uh, so there are specialists who teach it and they're basically reflex points um, on our bodies. Um, oh, yeah. I, OK. So, so that, we, yes. we could we can do some of it. So the this this will um, activate our kidneys and things. So we often. So energy healers will use tapping often to stimulate things, but it's all linked to meridian lines and, and all of that stuff that I don't really understand, but I do sort of. Um, but they do, they, there's, um, I know a woman who uses um, tappy bear. So she ha literally has a teddy bear and the child uses tappy bear to learn how to tap on themselves. And then they can do it very subtly underneath. So if they're in a lesson and they're feeling anxious, they can tap on particular points and it calms them down. Okay, I am familiar with that. Thank you, I appreciate that, thanks. Okay. So, um, so here we've got the stress bucket, which is, you know, discovering, discovery in action, in action, um, dot com Australian site. Um, and I love it. I mean, I, I think we've all got a stress bucket and it's about looking at what, build what builds into our bucket what so what's building into our our stress bucket our anxiety bucket um whether it's what are our stressors and if we've got a child who's suffering from anxiety i think it's really good to do that with them is is you know maybe have something that you don't maybe do it in one hit but you do it over time um it's something that they can add to um and oh yes actually this was making me feel anxious so this is something that is going to feed into my bucket because knowing what's feeding into our bucket helps us manage or avoid what's going into our bucket yeah and then how do we deal with it yeah 
how do we let the let the drips out? How do we let the water out? How do we reduce it? So it's about not letting the level get so high that that one drop makes it overflow and we get that explosion. So just to finish off, um, so if we've got learning and well, learning and emotions don't sit side by side. They're interactive processes and they influence each other in a dynamic way. And what we're aiming for is this optimal arousal, this optimal performance. So in order to help them achieve that, we need to help them, we need to understand the demands of learning um, and, the, and the behavioral difficulties so that we can adapt our teaching. Because after all, this is the sort of the, the peak that we're aiming at. So when, as part of my practice, one of the things I do is I try not to look at a child through a keyhole. Because if we look at a room through a keyhole, we only see a tiny part of the room. So I don't like to look at children through labels or through um, just through one lens. I believe in looking outside, looking at the whole child, what's going on. How we look, so I will look at memory, vision, auditory skills. I'll look at emotions and feelings, listening, speaking, understanding, attention, organization, time management, literacy and numeracy, and the physical coordination and the senses, because those are all of the things that impact on learning. And we can draw links, draw patterns, but if, if we don't look at all of these things, we're looking at the child through the key. So if you want to know more, there's more on my website, um, which is that, skylark-consulting. Um, or get in touch. So, um, has anybody got any questions? I could just jump in and just say a big thank you, Kate. I feel like you've left, left us with a lot and I can see a lot of wheels turning <laughs> and I'm sure that there's going to be lots of people getting in touch, especially after once we've kind of processed and absorbed everything to pick your brain a little bit more. I knew that there were quite a few of my students that I was thinking, well, actually, yeah, that makes sense. And there's a link that maybe I hadn't seen before. So I can, I can assume that that's happening for others, but yeah, let's open it up for questions. What do we think? I was just looking at the, um, uh, in the chat and the, there's a question from Elizabeth, um, is writing letters back to front dyslexia. Um, it's a, it's, it can be a trait of dyslexia, it can just be a developmental situation. And um, the markers of dyslexia are a difficulty with working memory okay. and, a difficulty, and a difficulty with phonological processing. So phonological processing is matching the sounds of the letters. Okay, so if, we, if, we, if, we, if we're having a difficulty with that and we've got a difficulty with working memory, yeah. there is a chance that we've got dyslexia. Letters back to front isn't isn't enough. Uh, okay, uh, um, and and what 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 about a D H ADHD? What about that? What do you mean? Uh, um. Uh, because my daughter has it. Um, well, I, I mean, I suggest that if you want to talk to me, the best thing to do is I'd always do a discovery call, okay. um, which is free, uh, okay. and you can book that through my Either. website. Um, but ADHD is a symptomatic diagnosis. If you tick, I don't know, six out of the nine boxes or nine out of the 12 boxes, I can't remember what, what it is, um, then you get the label, but the diagnostic route doesn't always look at what's underlying. So why okay. are we having difficulty uh, paying attention? Yeah. Okay. Put your, put Other people. 
feedback or any other questions? Yeah. For Amazing. Um, and I, One well, thing that I thought was really helpful was when you went through, Kate, understanding and picking what's happening neurologically in the brain during times of anxiety. And for me as an educator, I think this is a space that's missing with a lot of our students. So we actually spend a lot of time going through and teaching our students what goes on in their brain. Because I've noticed that a lot of individuals who have memory loss when they're anxious, they tend to blame their brain. It's their specific brain for the reason that they cannot remember. And it, it turns into an entire identity. So what we do is we go through explaining how everyone's brain at a certain level of anxiety will have difficulty with processing, will have difficulty with holding information. And I feel like sometimes even just that little nugget of information just takes an entire weight off of their shoulders because instead of it being their issue that's unique to them, they see that it is something that is universal and that opens up a whole new new dialogue. I, I totally agree, Sarahlyn. I think it, it one of the most important things is children are fascinated about how their brains work and, and especially anybody who's on the spectrum um, because they want to feel that control. I mean, let's face it, you know, Anxiety, we need to feel in control. We need to, our anxiety will often come because we're feeling out of control. Now, we haven't got the resources to deal with what we need to deal with, going right back to the beginning. Um, but actually going, okay, well, so this is where it's going wrong, or this is why I can't cope, and it's okay. And that's really good. Yes, it empowers individuals as well because mm. then we can take ownership of knowing what might our triggers be and where we might feel stuck and put in preventative care and put in preventative measures. And, and then it gives us the language to advocate for ourselves when we're in conversation with other people. And, and to be able to say, sorry, I can't cope with this right now. It's okay. Okay. And, and as adults, I think it's really important that we model that as well. You know, in the same way as we model problem solving and how we deal with things. You know, I've lost the car keys. Right, okay, I'm going to calm myself down and think clearly, because when I'm calm, I can think clearly. Now, when did I have them last? Mm -hmm. They're not there. Well, is there anything else I can do? Flexibility of thinking, yeah, being able to think of an alternative. Uh, I know we've got a spare set, and I've got them in the office in the filing cabinet, under car. Yeah. So if we model, things we're teaching the strategies and it's drip 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 absolutely charlotte you have something to say go ahead oh we can't hear you there we are no i was just trying to find the unmute button <laughs> um something that's come up quite recently on linkedin um somebody was talking about i can't remember what the um the name for it is but they they don't visualize I do a lot of work with children on mindfulness. We do a lot of work on meditation. I work a lot with children with uh, who are um, doing 11 plus and GCSE. So we do a lot of work on exam stresses and things like that. Um, but this whole thing, of, and somebody else was talking about the fact that it doesn't work for them as an adult because they don't visualize, they don't see pictures in their head. So I was just, wanting to brainstorm with Kate, with Sarah Lynn and other people who use a lot of mindful techniques. I presume there's obviously the breathing and things like that that we can do, but things like body scan, for instance, and some of the other techniques that, you know, the balloon breath, I suppose it's about sensory and feeling, but do you have anything you can add to that to really help particularly children, but maybe adults as well, where visualization is actually really difficult for them? Because one of the key things I do with my kids is I walk them through the exam room and we do a lot of work on preparing for the exam and visualizing it and visualizing it going well. 
But if they can't do that because they can't visualize, what else would you suggest could be a good, a good thing to help prepare them for the exam that isn't visualizing? I'm wondering if this is, it's, it might be, I don't know if it will be helpful, Charlotte, because it will be very specific what the exam room looks like. But if they're struggling to come up with a view of what it could be like, is there a way that we could use a video or AR, like augmented reality, where they're able oh. to be the camera so maybe even if you walked into a classroom and you just had it as the perspective yeah so you can walk them into the room walk them to find a desk walk them to see a clock or see however you role play would be good. role play through it yeah. so they're, they're actually moving through but you're giving them the visual and so then, instead of them yeah. having to create or i suppose just having the picture in front of them the and picture. kind of talking through yes it's just a thought because it's something I had I hadn't come across until I'd become an adult and started teaching children this idea that, you know, some people don't visualize that's not the way they think so mm. I just wondered if you had any other ideas. But well, that's for, mind idea. for mindfulness if you've got a child who doesn't who, who struggles with visualizing and um, you know it's face it any child who's got ADHD will struggle to do mindfulness, even though they're wanting to, you know, they really, really need it. And I found when I was teaching mindfulness to, to younger children, one of the things that they, the ones who the wrigglers really enjoyed because they needed touch, yeah, was being able to breathe in yeah. and breathe out and breathe in. So they're using the, it's the sensory. Yeah. They've got the feeling. Yeah. And then they're, and they're in control. They can do it as fast as slowly as they like. Yeah. But it's giving them something to do with those hands that they don't really know what to do with. Mm, thank you. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And if I could just highlight again that there's actually two methods to mindfulness. And we talked about it earlier. There's active mindfulness, which is sitting meditative. And then there's passive mindfulness and things that are breath based or gratitude based or body scanning or worry time those are still methods of mindfulness because they are allowing us to connect with the present moment so it doesn't have to be a still thing it can be very tactile i think it's whenever we can find a way to hyper focus in in into something that is becoming in flow that is becoming in the present moment and i think that is really what mindfulness is about so yeah yeah I always I, I always think of something like um something like climbing or um something that where you you actually you're in the present moment you're doing what you're doing so and you need to concentrate so much you can't possibly do start worrying about other things or you can't engage with the thoughts that might come through your head so actually a climbing wall can be a mindful activity yeah i'm gonna put that in my day as actually i'm not gonna say as an excuse because i do it anyway so i don't really need an excuse to be moving my body but if anyone is ever looking for another way that they can add mindfulness into their day i think that's a really great example coloring is another really lovely one as well mm. because you can get really into it perfect absolutely Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Kate. We're really grateful that you were able to spend the time with us and, and share a fraction of what it is that I know that you have capacity to share with us. So I do encourage, Kate has put her website in the chat box for us here, and I do encourage everyone to go in and connect with her. Um, if I can just come back as well, I know that we're on break, so I appreciate if people need to nip out and stuff, but Natalie, I saw your your post here. And I just want to make sure that it becomes, it, it is attended to. So Natalie's asked, what should a primary school be doing to support an eight-year-old pupil with suspected autism and EAL issues working at a four-year-old level? Is it down for the parent or the school to push for an EHCP? So um, not enough information there to give you a proper answer. Um, uh, do book a discovery call with me but basically any parent can apply for an education health and care needs assessment applying for the needs assessment is the first step 
Now, a lot of local authorities are, um, I hear, um, just kicking them out automatically. Um, and it's a, because they don't have the resources to deal with them. Um, so there's certain trigger points at which you can get external assessments um, to be able to lever the case. Um, but I mean, a parent can apply for an EHCP needs assessment. Um, but then it's always a case of saying, well, what do you want from an EHCP? What is it you're aiming at? Because there's no point in having an EHCP that doesn't have provision that is useful. Um, and also it's about bearing in mind what the child is going to need, probably in a year's time, by which because it's going to take you that long to get an EHCP in place. So it's a complicated, it's a very complex, and it's, you know, you need to, you need a lot of resilience. It's a battleground. Um, but um, it sounds like um, this child needs to be, um, needs to have their, their case fought for them. One of the biggest barriers to a needs assessment um, application being rejected is the local authority will maintain that the school hasn't spent enough money. So the school needs to show that they're spending about £6,000 of their resources on supporting that child and that they need more to be able to um, make the correct provision for that child. Um, and, you know, schools will say, well, you know, what we're doing, it's just good practice. It's not over and above. So it's a, it's a really tricky area. It's a big beast. Big beast. And I think knowing the right people to consult with, not only on how to navigate that landscape, but to create your own support system through that time is going to be key. Definitely. I, I mean, I, I know I don't work with anybody without having a free discovery call. Because often, you know, it, it I can't, I can't answer questions without allowing 20 minutes or so to be able to hear what the issues are. And it could be that I'm not the right person to help them or they just need some guidance about, well, actually go back to school and ask this, mm -hmm. that reassurance that, um, you know, that's okay to ask mm -hmm. um, or demand. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's why I do it because, um, so, you know, if you've got parents who are, who've got worries um, do direct them towards my website. They've got nothing to lose by having a conversation with me. And everything that they can gain. <laughs> yes.